Welcome back, boys, ghouls, and everything in between. It's that special time of the week in October again, where I get to look at some more monster movies. Let's skip the preamble and start talking about some killer creatures. Mutant, alternatively titled Night Shadows, is a hell of a movie to start the video with. It's about a zombie vampire outbreak in a small town, and it follows this guy, a real asshole named Josh. He's traveling out to the country with his brother to let him take some steam off, and I gotta say, the introduction of these two isn't on the best terms. Josh's idea of getting his brother to lighten up is to nearly get into an oncoming collision. He seems so weirdly unfazed and uncompromising. Mike, I really, I really want you to lighten up. He single-handedly gets him and his brother into the trouble of this film. If they didn't bother those rednecks, they wouldn't have had to deal with any of this. Without spoiling too much, what I like about this movie's story is that it's willing to kill off characters you would otherwise think would be key players. It sets up little wants and needs for them, and then subverts that. I don't know, it keeps things fresh because you don't know who's going to bite it. Look, Sheriff, there's a dead man outside. I think he's been murdered. Nice going. And gotta say, especially compared to the previous movies, this one really impressed me with its presentation. The opening shot hits you with this atmospheric imagery paired with a good soundtrack. It's the type of stuff that grabs me. There's a bit of intrigue in the plot here. There are tangible themes of being an outsider. You know, just stuff to chew on. What I don't like about this is that, even if it is building towards a crazy finale, the film takes a long time to get the ball rolling. Two thirds into the movie and the characters still don't know what's going on. Which is frustrating to watch because the main characters aren't all too likable. We're stuck with Josh and his new boring girlfriend for a majority of the film, and I really don't like them. There is a drunken cop character that elicits a bit of sympathy, but it's a character archetype I've seen plenty of times and doesn't really surprise. The zombies in this one, they're okay. It's a simple makeup job, but I like the spin on classic imagery with the yellow pus coming out of their hands. They all do this goofy hands up motion like they're being arrested. Every zombie extra is doing this, it's a goofy visual. The scene where the doctor lady describes all the symptoms as the guy in the other room goes through them is pretty cheesy, too. The hands of this poor creature would burst open because the body part could not withstand the pressure. Until finally the poor bastard is reduced to a quivering wasted piece of jelly. That climax is really the highlight of the movie. The rest of the film was reasonably engaging, if not imperfect. But there's a lot going on in the final minutes that's really fun. Zombies are breaking through walls to chase the characters, they're burning through car windows, Josh is throwing around Molotov cocktails, it's wonderful, so much fun. I genuinely had a blast here. It meanders a bit in that second act, and the characters the film decides to focus on aren't too likable, but once it gets going in the final act, it's a real treat. Mutant is fun, if you can give it the time. Prey, not to be confused with the 2006 video game of the same name, which isn't to be confused with the 2017 reboot to name only, which isn't to be confused with the 2022 Predator movie, is a British science fiction horror film from 1977. Please name your movie something else. Where are you going? For a pee, do you mind? The film focuses on Jessica and Joe, a lesbian couple living on private property, who encounter a strange man hanging around the area. The relationship between the women is a bit strained at this point. Joe is unhealthily possessive of Jessica and seems to not be too fond of men. In this case, she may have an actual reason, because this guy is a ravenous, shape-shifting alien. Now, this film starts out fairly normal, but things take a turn for the absurd when the alien starts living with the two women. Like, the movie itself has gone a little insane from its passive presence. Help! 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 
<laughs> there's a scene where a fox kills their chickens, and Joe swears bloody vengeance on the thing and goes as far as using a triple-barreled shotgun to hunt it. The alien wants to keep his cover and wants to stay on good terms with them, so he kills it like this. And to celebrate the death of the fox, the two women decide to hold a party with dresses and cake and everything. Eccentric is a word, and it perfectly describes this movie. But at the same time, I actually enjoyed the characters here. It's also a challenging narrative with vague themes the film lets the viewers sit on. The alien's intrusion on this couple's relationship suggests something predatory and voyeuristic. The film's title is even Prey, to drive home the point that this thing is a predator. But the relationship itself is already overly controlling and manipulative, before the alien even arrives. Jo is paranoid about losing her girlfriend to a man. I can do what I want and I can go where I want. And yet, Jessica doesn't go where she wants because Jo is keeping her in the house. The alien seemingly develops some feelings for them too. He's initially unwilling to hunt the two during a game of hide and seek like he's suppressing his hunter instincts. There's a surprising amount to chew on with this movie, and I think I like it. It is bogged down by a number of little scenes that feel pointless, but that's just another one of the film's eccentricities. The extended sex scenes are also a little much, but this is labeled as a sexploitation, so that's just what you get with this territory. They're supposed to feel a little voyeuristic because that's a running theme here. The viewer, like the alien, is watching what should be a private moment. It being a gory horror film adds another layer of entertainment, on top of being a genuinely interesting drama between three extremely weird characters. It can be unintentionally funny. It can be intentionally shocking. It got me to think a little. And the ending is fucking crazy. Prey is a wild movie, and it's my favorite of this collection so far. I'm gonna be remembering this one for a while. It's unusual that I got to see two good movies in a row. Let's see if the third continues the streak. I think I'm gonna pass out. You do and you'll be dead in a matter of minutes, Howard. The last snake movie was about a woman who turned into a snake. So the next snake movie is just about snakes. Probably should have let in with this one. Come on, Duke. Oh yeah, Rattlers is an ecological horror film that follows an investigation into a series of snake attacks. The film even has the balls to have its inciting incident see these two kids meeting their end to a den of rattlesnakes. It's all off-screen, and the weak acting from the boys dampens the effect. Hell, everyone so far is not great. A real live skeleton, huh? But it's a pretty crazy way to open a movie. Their screams playing over the title card even makes it a little disturbing. But you know how these things go. A movie like this starts strong, which means the rest of it likely isn't going to live up to that cold open. And yeah, that's the case here. He says he was attacked. Attacked? By snakes. When it's not focusing on the investigation into the cause of the snake attacks, it's scenes of one-off characters wandering around, essentially looking for a snake to bite them. It's a slow burn without the intrigue to justify it. It's so typical that I already knew the plot before I went in. Rather dull for the most part, but there is a little charm to the dialogue and blunt, simple structure. It even has some unintentionally funny moments, like the scene towards the end where a guy runs into a tent with a semi-automatic and starts blasting the snakes. He points it directly at the ground without care for ricochet. It's great. Do I even need to explain it's the result of a government experiment and they're covering it up too? You've seen this movie before, even if you haven't. What you probably haven't seen is a scene where these two characters, after narrowly escaping from a den of snakes, decide to go out on the town to celebrate their survival. It's ridiculous on a tonal level, but I'd probably do the same. This one's vaguely enjoyable, but mostly dull and skippable. You don't have to see rattlers. What is it? Snakes. Sounds of Horror. It's a Spanish horror movie about invisible dinosaurs. 
Depending on your perspective, this may be really lame or at the very least an interesting premise. I personally think there is a bit of audacity to it. To make the monsters invisible is really indicative of a low budget, but it has the potential as an exercise in sound design and audio mixing. If you call your movie a sound of horror, that should be the selling point, the sounds. And the sounds here are a mixed bag. So the film proper follows these casually dressed cave explorers whose violent explosions unearth a dinosaur egg. Several of them, I guess. So now there's a bunch of invisible dinosaurs running around. Try to be patient with us, Travos. She's only an amateur and a woman. Okay. It's explained that they're the result of a Greek curse. The problem with making your monsters invisible is, ironically, plain to see. A lot of the build-up to the creatures isn't very well communicated because the shots they're supposed to be in don't show anything. You don't see anything as simple as an impression of a footprint hitting the ground. No, you have to wait until the end of the film before they start doing that. The creatures don't have much of a physical presence, which is what would have made these moments scarier. That said, there are moments in this movie that kinda work. They know when to drop out the soundtrack to let the isolated monster noises fill in the gaps you don't see. The first attack scene where this guy is mauled by invisible monsters is pretty visceral for 1966. The three-dimensional space the monsters occupy is kinda vague. At first I thought this movie was about ghosts, especially with the wailing, but no, it's dinosaurs. It's not like we don't catch glimpses of them, but it's a little less than I'd want to see. Sound of Horror has some running themes like fear of nuclear Armageddon for some reason, but it's mostly just boring. I wasn't really enthralled by it, though I will admit it had some decent horror sequences for something that couldn't even afford monsters. It's on the longer side too. 90 minutes is a lot to ask from someone when you don't really see a lot of the film's threat. There are definitely better ways to do movies about invisible killers, and this had neither the budget nor energy to pull it off. Oh, very good. With a title like The Vampire's Night Orgy, you'd expect something a little more… perverse. That's what I expected at least. But nah. While there are some perverse elements, and a tame sex scene it does eventually happen, this is a fairly pedestrian 70s horror movie about a group of people getting off a bus to stay the night at a rural village, only to be systematically attacked by vampires. In fact, the town is populated entirely by them. Thank god an orgy doesn't break out at any point. The film opens with one of the worst burial services I've ever seen. These morons drop the coffin, come on guys, what the hell? I'm not gonna pretend I was really into this one. It's a lot of ill-fitting music and predictable developments. With the ghastly moans of the soundtrack filling in the moments of silence, this is certainly more of a vibe movie. Sometimes the soundtrack sounds like this, so it doesn't always work. If you don't jive with the vibe, this will likely not be a good time. It's plenty watchable, I do see value in something like this. Maybe with a better transfer, obviously. Call it a cop-out, but I wasn't really compelled to write much about this one. I want to move on to a movie I actually have something to say about. My throat is accustomed to lukewarm things. Like a glass of good cognac. Okay, next slot. Horror of the Zombies, aka The Ghost Galleon, is actually a part of a series of films called the Blind Dead series. The inciting incident of this one is strange, and goes on for what feels like an eternity. It starts with these two women voiced by the same person. It's like being on a man or something. A sensation I've never felt before. Oh, what's that? Participating in a bizarre publicity stunt where they stay adrift at sea, with no camera crew or anything. Hard to call it a publicity stunt when no one's around to see it. They cross paths with a creepy, fog-infested boat, and sure enough this is the titular Ghost Galleon. The first 20 minutes feel erratic and confused, 
It partially follows one of the model's roommates trying to find out what happened to her, and escaping from the people forcing her roommate to participate. It's heavily implied she's a lesbian, yet the film goes out of the way to show her being strangled by a guy working for the model agency, and it ends with a scene where she's… well, it's a 70s horror movie. I think you can see where this goes. I thought this movie was about ghost skeletons. So far we've just learned that the people running the model agency are creepier than the monsters. It's never brought up again, either. That happens to her and she dies later? That's just mean-spirited. I have no more time to entertain your fantasies. Yeah, the moment-to-moment -moment storytelling of this one is very weak. You could cut out the first 25 minutes and not miss anything of note. But the set design of the titular galleon and overall atmosphere is quite thick. Several scenes are dedicated to characters wandering listlessly, so the filmmakers made plenty use of their location. I'll admit, this one didn't completely grab my attention for its full runtime, but I appreciate its setting. The use of uncomfortable wide-angle lens, the long takes, the utter lack of soundtrack for the most part outside of the Blind Dead's chants. It can be genuinely creepy. The Blind Dead themselves are spooky enough as is, but all they do is walk slowly at the characters, and they still find ways to corner them. They're just so scared of these skeletons that they get cornered and are carried off to an untimely death. These guys aren't just zombies like the title of the American Cut implies. Nah, these are a little more sophisticated. They cut their meals into pieces first, then eat them. They're not savages, I mean, come on. These are civilized zombies. They do look a little goofy when outside the boat. They need that creepy lighting and setting. The other characters, when they finally arrive on the boat, are highly ineffectual. Nothing is real. Science would deny it. And you? Are you real? Because I'm not so sure science wouldn't deny your existence as well, Ruben. They are just fodder to be killed by the zombies. The scientist slash exorcist of the group seems to think they're in another dimension when they're on the ship, as they're unable to be seen by a passing ship. Which is preposterous, frankly. I told you before, we're in another dimension. That's what you think. The screenplay for this one must have been ten pages long and consisted mostly of directions, but there is a charm to the monsters here combined with the atmosphere that makes this one uniquely memorable. It's a movie I find hard to fully immerse myself in. There are just too many slow scenes and only the bare minimum amount of plot to justify it all. But if you're in the mood for something creepy and atmospheric, this movie works reasonably well once it starts taking place on the boat. Not too bad, but not a horror classic either. Maybe skip the first 25 minutes too. Werewolf Woman. Now this is a movie that's gonna demonetize the video. Kinda hard to talk about it, but I think it's worth looking at more than something like Invasion of the Bee Girls, which I largely skipped over in the final upload of that mad scientist part. So, I'll risk it. The movie starts and whoa, werewolf titties. Obviously I can't show them, but they look like two hairy oranges with nails sticking out of them. Yeah, the movie starts swinging with a dream sequence where a werewolf lady attacks a villager and gets burned at the stake. This comes from the mind of a woman with lycanthropy. She's been struggling with this lycanthropy for years as a result of being, uh, assaulted in the past, and she finds pleasure in violent acts. It's not so much a werewolf movie as it is a movie about a crazy woman who thinks she's a werewolf. It's more psychological. Like a vampire's kiss if it was played more straight and had more boobs in it. While it is trying to be sexy at points, there is an overt theme of sexual trauma and what it does to a person. It's more sad than titillating. For certain scenes, at least. For others, there's a disconnect between the content of the film and what the soundtrack and mood are trying to imply. 
This film has some intentionally uncomfortable sequences, where the idea that the werewolf lady is surrounded by a system that simply restrains her instead of helping her, you know, that idea is trying to be communicated. But one scene in particular sees her being licked up and down by a crazy roommate, and rather than realize she's being assaulted and, you know, reflect that, the movie sounds like something out of a bad porno. So the intent here is decidedly sensual instead of concerning, which I don't think was the right one. One scene where the intent of the film and the content actually lines up is the one where the werewolf lady looks longingly at a happily married couple, having consensual buggering in the other room. She wants what they have, but her traumatic experiences prevent her from being normal. Instead of having someone who loves her for her, she hallucinates being, uh, loved by a lizard. It's freaky stuff. This happens more than once in the movie, but with different people, so the ultimate effect of that is repetition. Like, I get it, she's got problems. The werewolf lady goes on a killing spree, and one of the more comedic deaths sees her repeatedly banging another lady's head into her steering wheel, which somehow causes her to bleed all over. Who comes up with this stuff? Despite having some things to say, I still wasn't totally into this one. And I mean that as a movie, and also the freaky stuff it showed. I know what I'm about, this ain't it. It's certainly saying something about how trauma can stunt people's sexual maturity, but like I said earlier, it's hazy in its message because it also wants to be titillating. It's also just kind of boring. I wasn't really a fan of its pacing. It stops to be a police procedural, and by then I was checked out. They're just repeating information at this point. This did not need to be 98 minutes. Nowhere near as bad as other movies in this collection. I was somewhat engaged up to a point, but it fumbles its message pretty badly and just comes off as mean-spirited. When it's not being ridiculous, at least. Gotta say, with Night of the Blood Beast being the 10th or 9th or 20th Roger Corman adjacent movie I've covered on one of these collections, I've grown fond of the generally lousy, almost stage play-like production values. I could do without the glacial pacing and the almost factory quality these things share. Some of these really feel like they're being made on an assembly line. But they all have the same music, and it's nice knowing that's always going to be there. This isn't a Corman-directed film, but it's got his and his brother's stamp of uniformity that I really can't hate. What's missing is the sort of tongue-in-cheek that his directed films usually have. That's not present here. Anyways, this movie's about a male astronaut who gets impregnated by a space parrot. Now I am able to speak by assimilation. A form of photosynthesis. Okay, there's a little more to it than that. He's initially thought to be dead after crash landing on Earth, and as tests are performed, his monster lover is going around attacking people at the facility he was brought to. They get marooned there because the blood beast seems to be generating a magnetic force field that disables vehicles and watches. Oh my god, he's white. <laughs> Sca <laughs> Just <that> realized. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be honest, I watched this one with friends. Believe it or not, there is blood in this movie, and it's shot pretty tastefully. How could that be? The entire hull is made of magnetic alloy. Of all the voices the alien got stuck with, it's so funny that it ended up sounding like Elmer Fudd. He will be mine to become a greater being in future generations to come. Don't kill me! With the allusions to body horror and the alien having parasitic traits, this movie has traces of the novella Who Goes There, or The Thing from Another World. Even the reveal of it is like that scene from The Thing where the creature bursts through the door. They even set it on fire. And gotta say, that is actually a genuinely fun reveal. That's why not. It's like an ancient jump scare. Steve. 
Yes? 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 And yes, I know this one was a mystery science theater episode. Bet you feel foolish now, typing that comment before finishing the video, huh? Steve, Steve, cut it out! The joke about everyone here being named Steve is on point. Every guy in this one looks like a Steve. And there's a moment where this lady calls him out and both of the men perk up. Who's Steve? Steve 1, you go that way. Steve 2, come with me. Night of the Blood Beast isn't horrendous. It's got flashes of ambition and the concept is delightfully weird for the time period. But it's a little dull and only worth a couple laughs. The end in a barely readable font. <laughs> all right, <laughs> yeah. do we get White paid text. for this? No. That'll be all for this week. Tune in for the final part for the final batch of movies. Spoiler warning, I think Prey was the last good one. Regardless, stay tuned for a movie about killer dogs. One about an island of snake people that doesn't have any snake people, but does have Boris Karloff. The whole cavalcade of aliens. And two of the worst movies I've ever seen in one of these collections. Stay tuned. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. Uh, sorry to the patrons who had to wait a whole month for this. First part was uploaded on August 12th, and at the time of this recording, it is now September 21st. So you guys had to wait a while. Sorry about that. Uh, the wait for part three definitely will not be this long. But yeah, here's a shout out to the top patrons who get access to videos like this one a little early than the rest. Manila fan, Gazner. Sampai, Gomo Regor, Golden Made Me an Ultraman Fan, Swoosh McJuice, Novik15, Jacob Hinch, Dudebro, Griffith J. Hertenstein, Alistair Gilmore, Seamus Kelly, Anonymous Euronymous1349, Fujoshi Urinal, Grazio, Driller, JCS, Rhyme and Ruin, Mulan Nguyen, Ultraman Taro vs. Leo, Irrelevant402, Hey, I'm Mooney, Krazak53, Komen, Queer Kaiju, Chronicler Waba, Alcoholic Alligators, Ryan Santa Cruz, Avok Robot, The Antagonist, Richard Ciavardon, It's God Z, Big Odilo, An Actual Demetrodon, CMG, Red Comet Harry, and Marpzilla. Thank you all very much.